Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you appreciate these episodes and these conversations and want to support, head over to patreon.com slash aksum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. You could also, if you're one of our people who watch and listen on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel directly. Today, I am joined by a good brother I haven't talked to in a long time, but got to reconnect with. CJ, how are you doing? Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Glad to be here, Hanuk. Of course, of course. So I recall that um, I used to work in this recreational center at our alma mater, Pepperdine University, shout out, let's go waves, yeah. called the, the Howard A. White Center, the or the Hawk, affectionately, by people who were there. And uh, there's a lot of different rental equipment that was in there, but I think one of the most frequently used, and people may be surprised to hear this, but uh, particularly international students at any time, and sometimes my shifts would be like 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., would come into the Hawk and request to play ping pong or table tennis. And I recall meeting you there and uh, you had uh, a series of what I interpret as, and you could reinterpret later if I'm wrong, kind of entrepreneurial moves even around there. And, and we could talk about other categories, but yeah. just to kind of set the tone of our conversation, how did you get into ping pong or table tennis? I imagine you didn't just start then because you were really good when I met you. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, it, a lot of practice beforehand, actually. So I got started when I was nine years old. Wow. And it just so happened to be when I was on a family trip to Cancun, Mexico. Where else are you going to start learning ping pong? And it was at this uh, resort uh, where it was kind of one of those places where you'd go back and um, we had a timeshare and we actually are one of the very few that enjoyed it. Uh, I know there's a bad stigma around, you know, timeshares and whatnot, but we actually really enjoyed it because we got to meet uh, people down there. We, so tell uh, me about that, if you can, briefly, because I, I am totally clueless about what the stigma there could be around timeshares. That sounds uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So timeshares, for those who don't know, basically places where you buy a physical unit within what would otherwise look like a hotel mm -hmm. and some destination that's usually a place you'd want to be around the world could be anywhere from Europe or Asia. This one happened to be in Cancun, Mexico, which is a very popular destination. Uh, so that's where ours was. And when you buy into this unit, you go there usually once every year, or maybe you buy two weeks out of a year, you buy weeks. And so we had one week around Halloween time. And we would always go down there during Halloween. So most of my Halloween celebrations were actually not in the United States. They were in Cancun. Wow. Yeah. And there was other people who also bought that same week that we got to know every single year. So it was like a reunion when we went back down there. And there were people from all over the United States and Canada. And we got to know them really well. And one of those uh, almost, you can call them family friends, really, because it was over many years. I actually kind of grew up down there. I got to know them. Mm -hmm. Uh, long story short, one of those people was a guy who's from Canada who used to be, he could have been locally ranked or even maybe uh, ranked within one of the broader provinces, even though I don't think he ever professionally competed, he was extremely talented. And at that time he was in, this is, you know, about 20 years ago or so, uh, he, as, as of right now, he was in his sixties and he'd been playing for many, many years. So he was also the type that allowed me to, uh, he didn't go easy on me, I'll put it that way. So I had to get good luck. <laughs> he didn't let you win? <laughs> nope, nope. And so it was up to me uh, to, in, in a friendly environment, in the atmosphere that it was, it was a good combination. And I've been a competitive spirit, I've had a competitive spirit from a very young age. So I already had it in me at nine years old to begin. Uh, and this was a start and I'd continued playing this for many years after uh, that initial introduction, because I was just, kind of hooked on this sport. It was very fun. It was physically exhilarating once you really get into the game. It actually can be. And also psychologically exhilarating too, because there's so many ways that you can play this sport from thinking through the speed, the spin, and uh, even the grip style to make sure you can react fast enough and hopefully score a series of points that can get you to win the game. Yeah, that's a good point. I've seen a lot of people, and perhaps it's because they're adults, maybe you were younger or something about you in particularly helped you pick it up quicker. I don't know if it's the excellence of the coaching of this gentleman, but I've seen a lot of people 
as kind of a young adults to adults try to pick it up and they they think it's much easier than it is and it looks yeah. easy to them you know uh, like i said the way that they grip the paddle the way that it hits it, it it's so facile that you know sometimes i remember with competitive games who take people would take their shirt off or they would be profusely sweating and they're like what's wrong with you why are you sweating playing ping pong and you you put that same kind of uh, naive critic in the in the position of of playing and they can barely get the ball over the net so i'm I, i'm wondering when when this guy began coaching you at, at such a young age were you able to like have successful you know rallies R rally for the for anyone who may not know is like you know the ability to get the ball onto the other side and back and forth at least more than once because i've seen a lot of people who will hit two rallies and be satisfied with that where i think any level of even like modicum competence has to be like 10 15 rallies yeah so i couldn't really hold too many rallies with him actually yeah because he, his technique was he really didn't um move his feet at all because wow. he could just and center himself so well so regardless of the side depth uh you know close to the net or far away from it kind of like you would see in tennis uh obviously tennis is a bigger court so you'd have to move but mm -hmm. he was uh, well positioned on the court um in this case being the court of uh, table tennis that he could just react very swiftly and so it was beyond a sport actually at that point um he taught me the consistency mm -hmm. how to be consistent with hitting it back to diagonally or back yes. and forth and i really like that because it created a sort of rhythm to think about how to improve at something and this something happened to being table tennis but i thought through that method and i've actually used that uh, i've applied it in other parts of my life as well uh, professionally but other uh, habits and hobbies of mine personally too and it's improved because the more consistent you do something the better you get at it especially if you're learning from the errors that you make along the way because they will be inevitable and if the errors are not uh, inevitable then it means it's too easy of a task and i recommend increasing really the you know the the goal uh, or at least the standard at which you hold yourself to achieve that task yeah i i like that it's uh... It's probably been overstated, but in a society that is increasingly handing out participation trophies, to have a space in which you know an old guy could beat up on a young a young guy, but yeah. in like you said, a friendly, competitive manner that allows you to get progressively better to to make um, you know the Japanese say kaizen, continuous improvement. Mm -hmm over over time uh, I mean it's, I mean it's, it's like almost all the major martial arts that's that's the goal every time is to just get a little bit better every day and it seems to be so many like nuggets of life uh, general life wisdom that that could be seen in there but just while we're on this uh, this this point I I started in high school and I was taught from scratch like you by a friend of mine who was on the tennis team. And so he played, you know, regular tennis first and then also played table tennis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he similarly did not go easy on me. In fact, he used to just uh, he was righty and he would beat me left handed and say, you're not worthy of my right hand. And so, you know, <laughs> he really egged me on to get eventually yeah. better to beating him with his his right hand until him and I were were competitive. Um, in that way but one of the things is he he taught me by just practicing with me by just playing with me just like a series of exhibition matches and i know from like video games and, and other things and just being an, an educator in different capacities in my life that some people learn by reading a book or a manual and and some people are more movement based in how they learn one of the things I remember at least at the time that you and I had met and began playing is it seemed like you had a better grasp than I did about some of the, um, for example, technical terms. Like even, even today, I think I know forehand and backhand, but when it comes to top spin, back spin, and, and some of these other things. Side did, spin did, as well. Yeah, side spin. Thank you. I, yeah. I didn't know the names of any of these things. How did you get to know like that aspect? Were you just like Googling Wikipedia or did you ever see a book or were there other kind of mentor figures? Combination of all those actually. So 
before uh, we met at Pepperdine, I had done some somewhat competitive uh, table tennis beforehand, as well as mm -hmm. training at a center that is uh, here in Silicon Valley, where, where I live. It's known as one of the top table tennis centers actually in the entire nation. Nice. And so I trained there for a few months and got to learn it a lot. I've also searched online, just seeing videos and understanding terms and techniques. And that helped a lot as well, just so I could run through in my mind what I was doing, what I could do differently. And it is a sport. A lot of people treat it as a hobby, but mm -hmm. there, you know, you can, there's so many activities you can treat. If you treat them as sports, you will find ways to not only improve in the game, but improve yourself because to get better in the sport, you have to think differently and ideally think cooperatively, especially the higher up you go, because even if it is a one-on-one -on -one sport, you're going to be cooperating with other people as uh, on a representative level whether it be local, at state, or provincial, depending on where you're living in which country, or even at the national level, and hopefully eventually international too. But it starts with the fundamentals of making sure you get that consistency and improve from there. I, I like your multi-pronged approach. When I was younger, I, I leaned heavily on just, just practicing. But as I've gotten older, I've, I've tried to do like what you said. like, And I think I picked it up from language immersion, where you've just got to subject yourself to every medium of communication that communicates on that subject to continuously like you said you used visualization videos reading and and playing or 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 practicing so i'm i appreciate that you did that the kind of entrepreneurial aspect that i think will let us uh talk about other subjects as well that i that i notice is i'm a little older than you and when you came before you came everyone just sort of played recreationally and it was haphazard and and ad hoc it was you know everything's on the fly yep. uh one of the big innovations you did is like you made it professional in terms of making it into a club you created the table tennis club mm -hmm. and then you use that as a launch pad to launch the first official tournaments there have been unofficial tournaments where just a bunch of people play in a row but you had like formal tournaments and uh, a friend of mine actually uh, one at least one or two of those and uh, I I did well but I didn't win the whole thing and uh, I, I would love if you could tell the audience about the idea behind kind of formalizing it into a club and then the idea to making uh, a tournament out of it because I I think there's so many people who just are passive participants in whatever that may it may not be table tennis it may be something yeah. else but there's something that sets apart you know certain individuals as uh, as pioneers and and i'm very curious as to you know what what prompted you to do the, those two things in particular yeah well it's been a drive like i mentioned i've been competitive i've had a competitive spirit for a long time and when you really got it inside like just something has to express itself better and better and better structure becomes a natural form of, of expression because to get better, you have to have some form of structure. And hopefully it's agile enough to work with you instead of against you, but having some foundational structure helps. That form of expression within a college or a university environment like this was a club. And that's how I viewed it. It was not just to start a club for the sake of it, it was to allow myself and hopefully others to get better as a result of that too. Mm -hmm. And I went through the, like you mentioned, the entire process of starting a club, everything from writing the pitch document of what this concept was going to be to going to those uh, series of meetings with the representatives at the university at all levels needed and being a representative also within the inner club council. Uh, I think it was weekly or every couple of weeks or monthly, it's been too long now, but uh, it was fun because when I went to those meetings and I saw what other club members were doing and how they were promoting and got ideas for how we could promote the Pepperdine Table Tennis Club as well, or we could cross promote with each other or invite people to come along. And these gave me some really neat ideas to augment it that way. And it just gave me a, a, a bigger voice within the university that was really fun and also add value to the members such as yourself, who um, I was fortunate enough to have joined the club. And through there, we just happened to have different types of tournaments and some we opened up, some we kept closed, so everyone could just kind of 
and compete against themselves because y'all were training like myself just more frequently mm -hmm. and we just really enjoyed the game as, as much as we possibly could and it was, a, it was a really neat way to um really uh just enjoy life a bit more yeah i <laughs> i i love that you said that because some people are either intimidated by or you know especially in their free time not interested in structure but mm -hmm. i have seen in my in my own time in my own life i've waned i've had ups and downs of um you know athleticism and other things and if i had to point to one sort of word whether you call it discipline or structure that has been probably the determining factor of whether or not I'm going to up or down in my life. I like to think I'm going to up in my life in regards to, let's say, podcasting is just one feature. I'm about a year and a month into podcasting for, for this podcast. I did do a, a kind of Bible-oriented podcast a few years ago from uh, 2016 to 17, which was my first foray, which was audio only. Now I'm I'm in the video space in addition to, to audio and that no question the difference there between you know having one and not is structure it, you hold yourself yeah. accountable and you keep finding ways to improve like with especially the people who are supporting these projects monetarily i feel an extra responsibility like how can i keep making this thing better how do i improve the the quality of it and and these kind of people skills and uh idea building that you had from such a young age, which is incredible. That's we're talking about such a long time ago, you know, over a decade ago that that you did this, and and a couple decades ago that that you first learned. You've yeah. uh, uh, since been delving more and more into the realm of of marketing. H how did you get into marketing? Yeah, I, I got into it starting with social media. I was an mm -hmm. intern back at during Pepperdine's time and it just kind of fascinated me because I had joined social media only really when I began uh, at Pepperdine but it was quickly I saw this is something where regardless of where I am in the world I can still allow myself to express a thought that's on my mind in a way that other people can engage with and do that for free at scale <laughs> and it, it, it was a cool concept. And I thought, wow, I mean, businesses can really leverage this a lot. Yeah. And I, I was fascinated by that. So when I was learning this on my own personal time, just sharing photos and posts and whatnot, when I had the internship as well, this coupled with me thinking just like, there's so much potential. What if I learned a bit more about how social media works? Mm -hmm. And I started doing that. And as I started doing that, then I learned other types of supporting topics in the realm of marketing, such as content creation, not just form, not just informal posts, but formal blogs or different mm -hmm. types of other formal content assets that need to be created that evolved into much more, but that's where it began. So which medium did you begin with? Was it Facebook? Because that's the typical kind of uh, college one. And I, I recently watched The Social Network. You'd be surprised for the first time. Oh. I know that that's about a decade <laughs> old, but I just watched it like a month or two ago for the first time and it ages pretty well. It does. It does. There's some principles that just outlast the, the years in which they were made. And that's one of them in terms of how you start a startup, the deception that may be involved and how you get past that. And <laughs> Other other types of um, you know techniques, but I started with Facebook mm -hmm. as the channel, and then it went into Pinterest and Twitter, and you know it, it's not like there are necessarily too many novel or new channels coming out. It's the fact that when there is one with a large enough audience, how can you leverage that one to your best abilities? And that's a lesson I learned too, because when you start out, you think, oh, this is a cool network, but then what's the next one, and then what's the mm -hmm. next one, and then etc. But it's not about always getting what's new. It's a matter of being where people are at. And if they're there, well, then you engage them there. And if you want them somewhere else, sure, you can try that, but first engage them. And then you can learn from that and then apply that in different, uh, what are called channels, whether it be online or offline. I've seen people get very talented at just one of these and almost feel a bias towards the others and and i've got a follow-up for this if if you could answer but 
sure. do you do you have any advice for someone let's say they they feel like they're only good at instagram right if they're more picture oriented or if they're more word oriented they're only good at twitter that, that that's mm -hmm. probably the ones i've seen most frequently like where the disparity between their followers is sometimes tens of thousands if not more between you know one social medium and another do, do you have anything to kind of fight against people's biases if they just find themselves leaning like if they find one more more easy than another in terms of if they are on one channel and they want to get onto another channel yeah yeah basically i want you to discourage them from being biased against them and to, to be everywhere <laughs> <laughs> unless you have counter advice <laughs> yeah well, well first off there's that adage that says don't try to be if you try to be great at everything you're going to be the master of nothing along those lines i'm sure the phrase is a little bit different but the idea is don't try to be great at everything because guess what we cannot be great at everything mm -hmm. we don't have the time to do this nor the skills because as great as our minds are there is only so much that we can be great at because it's practically limitless so we got to choose and choosing doesn't mean only one either it doesn't mean five or ten it's not really actually about the number. Most people focus on the number and it's completely natural because that's what we're presented with. Mm -hmm. I do it reverse. So I think about literally the biology first of the people because end of the day, engagement is just a term that describes how we are biologically engaged, you know, dopamine, et cetera. And this starts with the two primary types of sensors. We have enteroceptors inside and exteroceptors. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the word of course right now, but enteroceptors and exteroceptors, are, that second one might be a little bit different, but basically internal and external. So the common ones that we hear about are what people look at often, what people listen to often, or what people, you know, um, may, if you're in the culinary sort of field, what they eat often, different mm -hmm. types of food or drinks, and depending on what you're marketing, right? There's going to be different types of engagement that you have. So if you're talking about food, well, it's probably not as big of a market as if you are uh, one that's allowing people to sample your food, or if there's different types of events like trade shows or whatnot that might be different in terms of reading or being more, much more visual with billboards, etc. So it depends on what you are promoting and then where it is best to promote it based on the different types of senses that people naturally engage with it best. And if that happens to be one channel, great. If that happens to be three, even better. If you can hit a sweet spot of three to five because you're getting all these primary senses engaged, awesome. I like that. Yeah, I'm probably more three to five, uh, as you said. Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. There we go. That <laughs> uh, that's me. <laughs> more that's me. Than I said it. <laughs> uh, I feel like you're talking about me. No. Uh, uh, yeah. I've, no. I've, that's uh, it's something I've struggled with. Um, I've heard Russell Brand talk about it before. I think it's related to, in psychology, the big five personality traits, trait openness. I remember one time with my siblings, we took the test and you take different tests, get different results. But at one point I hit 100 on the trait openness. Wow. And uh, one of my sisters said, I don't think that's a good thing. And, <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't think any of those personalities are in any way objectively better than one another, but it's good to know kind of where your tendencies and leanings are so that you can, yeah. you know, lean into them and then fight against them. So for me, the structure that you talked about early on is a way of combating or, um, you know, mitigating the risk of being too open because yeah. I am, you know, down for almost anything people uh, propose to me and I got to uh, sit back, reflect a little and, and think about how useful or functional that's going to be to me. I, we talked about Cancun, Mexico, which is yeah. one oh. one place you've. Oh, Before jump in. Go ahead. Topic, Go ahead. Go ahead. This is important. Go ahead, please. There's no such thing as a good or bad personality. No such thing. We are who we are, and we can own that however we want to. And so, if you want to change it, go right ahead. If you want to live with it, go right ahead. Right. Nothing wrong either way. And what I can say is that all different personality types are needed in this world especially from what I've learned, because if at one extreme, we were basically all the same, we kind of did all the same sort of stuff. Well, this would be a very boring world because mm -hmm. there'd be practically nothing new. And if we were all all over the place all the time, like, well, then it'd just be way too much chaos because we wouldn't know what the heck's going on. 
And so this blending of personalities is really something that creates magic in a way, some stuff that occurs, but you're not necessarily sure how it occurs or why. And that's really cool. And maybe when you are looking at all these different types of opportunities all the time, sure, reflection can help because then we can make sense of it. But at the same time, you're likely really good at cross-pollinating ideas where you see ideas from one space and you can apply it to somewhere else. And that means you're naturally more creative than a lot of people, which is pretty useful in most all spaces that I found, especially in marketing, which is the space that I focus in. So, you know, I would say if you're open to it, be proud of who you are and, you know, the types of personality uh, traits that you have. Thank you. That's very much appreciated. I've, I've found myself almost in any space, usually, you know, whatever, outsider, pariah, different somehow. And so I think that's allowed me to, to because of necessity and a similar competitive spirit to you, own and accept this kind of comfort with difference that yeah. I've, I've come across a lot of people who, who don't have that, who have more the idea, you know, you cut down the tallest blade of grass, that everybody should be more of the same. And there's nothing more soul crushing than to me than being in a, an environment where everyone wants to impose, you know, a hundred percent, whether it be ideological purity or, or, or that level of purity in yeah. any other category, it makes me feel squishy. So I, I appreciate your embrace of, of difference. And, um, that probably may be behind, um, Oh, go ahead. I said, sure thing. I mean, uh, it, it just, it feels more natural. I mean, it's one of those things where if, first off, no one is pure. Like it, there's no such thing as pure because basically pure means perfection. Uh, there's nothing, no issue with it. Or if it, it is absolute and unchanging. And I, I would imagine if there is such a thing as purity or perfection, it does not exist here on earth. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is saying it, well, it's somehow been mistranslated along the way. So when they purport those ideas, we got to listen sometimes with a grain of salt and if they really know what they're talking about or if they don't and, you know, uh, weigh it accordingly. That's right. I, I think I once mentioned to people, I, I try to take everything with a kilogram of salt. So <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it makes things easier if you've got that uh, skeptical eye towards everything, but also towards being skeptical itself. Um, yeah. Savvy skeptics. <laughs> yes. You, your embrace of difference is probably, you know, probably fostered by your parents who took you to Cancun at such a young age. Um, I've never been to Mexico, but I should. I've been to Honduras, but never Mexico, which is much closer. And uh, I know another place that you've been is is China. And I watched when one of my favorite entrepreneurs, Gary V, would talk about this thing called Musically, and I never jumped on it. Um, a little bit because I was biased as a as an age thing, I began to see people doing things with Snapchat that I didn't know how to do, and Musically just seemed like another thing where I was like, okay, now I'm getting old. At one point, Musically changes and becomes TikTok, and mm -hmm. I know there's some kind of politics associated with that too, and whether it gets banned or not, you know, who, currently who, there is, who, yeah, who who owns it and things like that. In in any of your marketing campaigns, I wonder if you've engaged with TikTok, or if you feel you're too old to do so or uh, anything anyone could tell me about TikTok, i love to hear i, I have a, a a roommate who told me and waxed poetically that they were able to get their job because of information they learned on TikTok, and that's that encouraged me to want to learn more and, and more about it if there's anything that you've engaged with regarding that yeah well first off age is a number and to distinguish it between old and young is a mindset. So they are different. Um, do I consider myself old, so to say? Uh, no, because it's a matter of, when it comes to marketing, just knowing who you're going after, who you're trying to engage, where are they? And do what you can to engage them. And so in my field, so I do work in marketing, but my type of work is not as much about uh, social media anymore. Okay. It's shifted away from there uh, okay. a number of years ago. And I do more what's called high stakes or high impact marketing this is where I write content for very confidential conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, executives at companies could be up to like fortune 100 companies. 
And most of my work is not seen publicly nowadays because it's wow. behind NDAs, but uh, which is kind of like the exact opposite of consumer facing content. Yeah. I totally understand how it works because a lot of these platforms are the same. It, it's a matter of how you use the, ha the hashtags, staying within their sort of uh, basically time guidelines and understanding the current trends based on the hashtags and a number of other factors, of course. Uh, but it, it's pretty simple compared to high stakes and high impact sort of conversations because those are a lot more intricate, intricately uh, managed in the moment and also as a series until you lead up to the sale. Yeah, NDAs or non-disclosure agreements are actually within the field that I studied of alternative dispute resolution. Oh, really? And yeah. I yeah. actually didn't know that. Uh, yeah, they absolutely are. And I'm a big fan of them because I have this kind of macro view of um, you know the legal system or the justice system. And I view NDAs as um, a nonviolent approach within the system that I think has varying degrees of, of violence within it that it perpetuates on people in different ways. Some of the bad rap I think that it's gotten is, for example, um, when it's regards to the Me Too movement, when there are certain accusations and rather than going through the court system, sometimes people will get upwards of $10 million. I think one of the NDAs I saw uh, people talking about was like $35 million out of uh, Fox News, but you see it in, in multiple different places. P putting that kind of aspect aside, to me, the more interesting question about these different forms of marketing that you've worked with is, I know people who've worked at Kirkus, for example, reviewing books. And one of the things that they do that I, I thought was so strange is they don't allow their writers, uh, I don't know if this is still a policy, but at least a few years ago, this was true. They didn't allow them to have a portfolio to point to these things. They kept all the reviews anonymous. I'm wondering, how do you advertise your portfolio when you're dealing with matters that are you know, so important that they have these NDAs associated with them? Yeah, well, uh, it's not easy, <laughs> but it, it's a great question. It depends on the people you're working with, honestly, mainly because mm -hmm. yes, there are policies. Yes, there are going to be procedures that they say you can do this or can't do this, when you can do it with who, et cetera. But there are cases when even when you disclose certain information, if you have the trust of the person, they know that you're not acting in a malevolent way. You don't, you're not gonna harm them really in any way that would harm their business, nothing that would harm them personally. I mean, I, I never set out to do that. You, I always try to build the best relationships that I can. And that's before I even think about business, like relationships are key, especially when you can enhance the value of them through win-win situations, however possible. So that's how I think of it first. How am I treating the people? Hopefully I'm treating them well. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, there's a level of trust. And if I disclose certain types of key figures, this could be just high level campaign metrics or uh, bottom line revenue figures without disclosing the company, there's a certain level of trust to the public that they have to have in me too. Just saying, look, I have done this. If you ever need to, I have the documentation to prove it. I have the resources to show you. you got the receipts. Uh, but sometimes, what's up? You got the receipts, as the kids say. Yeah, I got I got the receipts. And sometimes you can't show them, but if people press you, just make sure you have them. And that's what I do. I do have some big claims because um, they don't maybe sound normal for someone of my age. Typically, they have a bit more gray hair uh, when they've done it. But it's just because of two, well, three, I'd say three primary reasons. One, I, I work very hard. I work literally every single day. Some people say they work every day on improving themselves. I do it in a systematic way where I have frameworks that I use every single day that I've been improving for over 10 years. And that's one. Uh, two, I know some of the best sources to find information through and I work it back into my frameworks. Um, some of them are just undisclosed. Um, and <laughs> I know you're gonna ask that. And three, most importantly, which uh, most anyone can start uh, to try to achieve is having mentors that are experts in their field. In mm -hmm. other words, uh, there's two primary factors I keep in mind. They can achieve a, an intended result and do that, number two, consistently. 
I, I consider those types of people experts. And the other one is those who are trustworthy, where what they say they will do, and typically they overachieve. And I find a lot of those people. I've been very fortunate because I have the work ethic that I do, because I hold myself a certain way within rooms. I don't act like most people my age, and it allows me to speak coherently within rooms of people twice my age or people that are, are worth millions, people who have millions of dollars in budget, uh, even in the billions sometimes. And it, I don't panic anymore. Uh, sometimes you do when you think of all this influence that's in this room or all this potential. And end of the day, what I've learned is they're really just people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have fancy titles sometimes, and yeah, they have some amazing capabilities, but they're still people with their own concerns, and most of the things that they do in life are pretty much the same. If there's a gap that you can find, and you can fill that gap with it, in my case, might be con creating certain types of content assets, which are very useful for their key activities to grow the business or align the team or et cetera, then they actually need you, right, in a way, and so, and you need them. So it's this cooperative relationship where you can get the egos out of the room, you can get the stuff out in a way that what's remaining is a relationship that's healthy that you can build on. And that trust, again, starts to be built up too with that relationship. And it's amazing what you can learn when people open themselves up in that environment. I I couldn't agree with you more. It's so incredible when I could reconnect with you after so many years and realize how we uh, were probably drawn to each other. It was not just table tennis or ping pong in the first place, but this deep belief in, in mentors. I was always young for my year. I was a fall baby, and my parents intentionally had me be younger than everyone else rather than older. I was one of my earliest educational environments was Montessori, which one of their chief principal philosophies is mixed age groups in the same classroom, not just dividing people by age. Like you said, it's it's a number. And mm -hmm. uh, even as recently as this past year at my wedding, one of the monks who was uh, officiating, he was, <laughs> one of the things he was saying to the audience, which cracked me up and made me cry a little bit, was he said, really, Henoch is the friend of the monks because these people are in their 60s and 70s. And he was talking about how he spent more time in the pandemic with them than like with my parents. I went home and spent some months in time with my parents, but then I... I, uh, I said, let me go hang out with the monks for the rest of the time. And there's, like you said, they're experts. Cool. Uh, yeah, they're experts really cool. in, in something. They're trustworthy and they're significantly yeah. uh, older, meaning not just age for the sake of age, but, but for the sake of uh, exactly wise. intellect, wise, they got the experience. And so we're absolutely on the same page about uh, that. One of my favorite rappers, Jay Electronica, he said it in a funny way too. He said, if you want to be a master in life, then you need a master. And you know, some of that uh, terminology might be tough for people in the 21st like century, but yeah, the master apprentice relationship. Uh, even one of my favorite books is called a uh, magician apprentice. This is kind of sci-fi fantasy book. And it, it starts off in this um, medieval kind of setting where, you know, there's a blacksmith and there's a, a horse runner or whatever. There may be all these professions. And uh, one kind of uh, outcast kid finds like uh, the like weirdo magician in town and becomes <laughs> the apprentice <laughs> of the. And, and then it gets into like space travel and it gets really crazy story throughout the series. But uh, to your point, it all begins with this uh, mentor mentee relationship. Uh, built upon trust and expertise. So I, I appreciate that very much. And you've been very generous with your time today. Do you have any other straight thoughts or anything to, to plug to the audience and any, anything to um, uh, plug in terms of sending them anywhere if you want them to follow you or follow someone that you do follow? Yeah, I, I think one, one last topics I'd like to cover today. There's so many. <laughs> there, there, there's so many that come to mind. But you could come back and we'll do a Joe Rogan length one. Cool, cool. I like, I like that. Um, I will definitely keep that one in mind. You know, in the current climate or ethos of could be the United States you're thinking about, but even globally, there's a really interesting trend going on right now there's more you could say polarization in other mm -hmm. words people seem to be getting in arguments more frequently and when they do 
usually, usually more heated. I've spoken with a wide, wide variety of people. Some people say it's eh, not that different from even 30, 50 years ago. And some people say, no, it seems like a lot more heated. So my point is that we're living in an age where opinions are not necessarily fundamentally different. It's just a matter of they're clashing much more frequently in ways where the, the amount of empathy seems to be decreasing. And when that usually happens, uh, more cruel things can can happen. Uh, people don't treat um, one another as people as often anymore because when you're online, it's easier to not do that. And so I don't mean to necessarily drag down the you know uh, temperature gauge of uh, this conversation, but my my point of this is as a marketer, as someone who just studies sociology and psychology, I have been really interested in the concept of accountability. And accountability seems to be lacking in a lot of areas in life nowadays where how are people helping one another just out of the goodness of their hearts uh, and for other reasons too. But there are a lot of people that don't seem to be fulfilling as much as they want to nowadays. They seem to be settling. Uh, not everyone, but there are a lot of people that either are settling or they're following more often. And there's, it's not inherently bad to do those things. It's just a matter of when you do it so often and almost with a level of complacency. And uh, my, as an entrepreneur, as someone who, you know, you can call it a pioneer in some respects on a micro level, so to say, but in some others larger, um, own who you are is like owning who you are is so important. Because when people do that, when we do that, we become happier as a result because we understand ourselves more. We understand what comes as a result of how we act with others. And we can just understand when life is so unclear, accountability, when we basically follow through the, what we say or when we hold ourselves you know, to what we uh, believe, we start to understand ourselves better. And when that happens, we can act more logically in life. We can start to cooperate with other people better and happier and with less stress. And so that's just, you know, I, one thing I would emphasize is greater accountability, start small and build up from there. Thank, thank you so much, CJ. I, I don't think you're wrong. And I don't think you're changing the mood of the conversation. As I said, my expertise, my, degree was in dispute resolution and one of the things i do is i i view what are existential threats to society and so when people say this when they ring an alarm people think oh you're being alarmist and it's not that i think there's a hundred percent likelihood of something like that but if there's even a five percent a three to five percent likelihood of for example in this country with the polarization you're talking about and i'm not mm -hmm. the only one saying this another civil war the solution is not to just be alarmist it's i think what you said to begin with individual accountability and incremental growth or continuous learning that we've been talking about yeah. this this whole time so thank you so much for saying that and for joining the program absolutely and uh if anyone wants to learn more they're welcome to check it out my personal website. Um, I have different types of marketing tips on there, a bit more about me and possibly where I could help uh, some of these uh, listeners listeners out today and what their pursuits are. That would be my personal website at my first and last name, so cjterrell.com. Um, Terrell is spelled T-E-R-R-A-L.com.